It's been nearly two weeks since the Dixie fire started and is showing no signs of letting up. And it's not just the fire trucks in front of the store protecting it. Unprecedented wildfires. You can hear that son of a gun roar now. There is fire activity happening in California that we have never seen before. Record breaking temperatures. We had temperatures end up close to 115 degrees. Historic rain and devastating floods. The Sacramento area has been identified as one of the most risky places in terms of flooding in the country. And extreme drought conditions. Here's an example of just how desperate things have become. The extremes are getting more extreme. We're getting larger floods and bigger, more frequent droughts. All signs, our world is changing. You gotta throw out all the old books in terms of expectations and reliability strategies, everything else. Mother Nature leaped far ahead. We are in uncharted territory. California has a climate crisis. Good evening, I'm Fox 40's Chief Meteorologist Christina Warner. Thank you so much for joining us. When it comes to California's climate crisis, look no further than Folsom Lake and the current state of our reservoirs. This year, the lake level has actually been better, but as this drought fueled by climate change continues, we're once again starting to see the water recede, revealing the parched lake bed that's become so familiar. The major reservoirs that we depend on for our water supply are all less than half full. Folsom Lake is at 39% of capacity, Oroville is at 36, and Shasta is down to 34%. Shasta is California's largest reservoir, and it has been hit really hard by the current drought. But what happens there does have an impact here in the Central Valley. Fox 40's Dennis Shanahan has a look at that impact and how it affects us all. One hundred seventy five miles north of Sacramento, Shasta Lake is a sprawling reservoir capable of holding almost five times the water of Folsom Lake. When it's full, Shasta boasts 365 miles of scenic shoreline. But these days it's impossible to ignore how that shoreline is shrinking. Right now we're 150 feet down. That's you can see the big band of shoreline there. That's 150 feet. As area manager for the Bureau of Reclamation, Don Bader is the man in charge at Shasta Dam. This is the keystone of the Central Valley Project, a federal water project in the state. The lack of water in recent years has led to some difficult decisions when it comes to how much water to release out of Shasta Dam into the Sacramento River. A certain amount is required to protect endangered Chinook salmon. There are many other environmental considerations downriver. Big picture, the Central Valley Project serves quite a bit more agricultural water demand than it does urban. And in a normal year or a wet year when they have full supplies, a lot of this water would be irrigating acreage in the Sacramento Valley. And through a network of canals, Shasta's water would reach farmers as far south as Bakersfield. But not right now. Very little going to the farmers the rest of it going to environmental needs and to the, to the public safety and health. Many farmers have simply been unable to plant for lack of water in Shasta and surrounding reservoirs, impacting their livelihoods and the prices you pay in the produce aisle. On the day we visited Shasta, the lake level was at 34% of capacity, 58% of normal for late September. The stark reality of a reservoir at this level comes into focus when you explore areas that should be underwater. Right now, I'm standing at the bottom of a long boat ramp, but the water level is at a point where some of the boat ramps don't even go to the water anymore. The pavement simply meets the dirt. If not for rusty reminders of civilization, images from areas of dry lake bed could be confused with pictures from a Mars rover. And at the Holiday Harbor Marina, the boat docks are not in their normal location. We've had to make drastic changes. We've had to move our marina all the way out to uh, adjust for the lack of water in our cove. And, uh, you know, relocating out here is, is a big task. Marina manager Kevin Kelly wants people to know even in a time of drought, Shasta Lake is still a great place to visit. And the water's beautiful, the fishing's great. 
The people that have come here all these years, I'm sure would love to come back, but they're probably thinking there's no water in that lake, but there's a, there's a ton of water. You know, I heard him say one time it was going to take seven years to fill up, and it filled up in one winter, so. Even now, it's holding more water than any other reservoir in California, and everyone we met here shares a common belief based on experience. Let's call it a reservoir half full outlook that this lake will rise again. I'm just hoping for a normal winter. That would really help us get back to where we need to be. Hoping for a normal winter while adjusting to a new normal. At Shasta Lake, Dennis Shanahan, Fox 40 News. Thanks so much, Dennis. Right now, the entire state is experiencing some sort of drought. The drought monitor released every week by the Western Regional Climate Center shows us just how bad it is. It's not a forecast. It's a look at our current conditions, taking into account lack of rain, temperature, water supply and soil moisture. Northern California is facing severe to extreme drought conditions right now. We saw minor improvements early this year, but conditions worsen quickly. A good water supply is crucial, and for that, we need storms. We can take a look at weather patterns like La Nina and El Nino to try to determine where we're headed for the winter months. This year, we're looking at another La Nina. Fox 40's morning meteorologist Adam Epstein shows us what that means for us. A network of 70 buoys constantly measures the temperature of a specific section of the Pacific Ocean near the equator. Small differences of one degree Celsius above or below normal can have weather impacts that reverberate around the globe. This climate phenomenon is called ENSO. It stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. There are three phases it can be in. Two opposite phases, El Nino and La Nina, plus a neutral phase. El Nino is a warming of the central tropical Pacific Ocean surface to above average temperatures. Normally, trade winds push warm surface waters towards Asia. However, in certain years, trade winds weaken, pushing warmer waters off the coast of South America. This results in a pattern that tends to allow more storms to impact California. La Nina is a cooling of the ocean surface in this region. There are years when trade winds are stronger than usual, causing cooler water to surface in the eastern Pacific in a process called upwelling. This results in a strong area of high pressure off the west coast that tends to force storms north of California. One of the beautiful aspects of ENSO is that we can skillfully predict conditions two to six months out. The odds are extremely high for a La Nina winter, just like last year. This typically results in near normal or slightly below normal water years for Northern California. One example is this water year, totaling almost 17 inches of rain at Sacramento Executive Airport, with the normal being just over 18 inches. One year can be a fluke though. So I dug through the data since ENSO conditions started being recorded in 1949. It turns out that Northern California has the best chance of above normal rainfall during a strong or weak El Nino year. That means a sea surface temperature of at least 0.5 degrees Celsius above normal. These patterns shift every two to seven years and six of the last seven years have been La Nina or neutral. So a change might be right around the corner. Christina, back to you. Governor Gavin Newsom's climate agenda is one of the most aggressive in the country. I had a chance to sit down with his natural resources secretary, Wade Crowfoot, to get his take on it. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for yeah. sitting down with us, Secretary Crowfoot. I think the first thing that I've noticed in the last couple of weeks is this administration has been very aggressive. We've seen many bills signed into law. The governor has been out. You've been busy. Does this state really have any other option but to be aggressive at this point? We have to be aggressive combating climate change at this point. Californians are on the front lines, whether it's drought, wildfire, extreme heat, and of course flooding and sea level rise never too far away. So we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change, so we have no choice but to work to lead the world in combating this crisis. Is it important for the state to be a leader? It's critical. I mean, first of all, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, and we've led the way on transitioning to a clean energy future, clean transportation future. We have to show the world that this can get done. Recently, we've had the heat wave in early September. We've seen wildfires year after year. It's sort of getting harder and harder for Californians to deny the fact that things have changed and we need to do something about it. Yeah, Governor Newsom says, if you don't believe the science, believe your own damn eyes. Mm -hmm. We have experienced the worst wildfires in the state's history in the last few years. We just experienced, I think, the hottest and longest heat wave in the state's history. And of course, the drought is worsening just a couple of years after the last drought, uh, the worst drought in modern history. So yes, I mean, wherever you live in California, you are experiencing it and it's impacting your life. 
the old data, the norms, the records, all of that that you would use to make prediction as to where we're headed, make forecasts as to where we're headed, that's kind of been thrown out, right? Everything now, the whole old playbook, so to speak, is out. Absolutely. I mean, we've had weather variability throughout what we know as California's history. So that's droughts and floods, cold periods and warm periods. But this heating climate, this destabilized environment across our, our planet is supercharging this, this variability. It's making our dry periods drier and our wet periods wetter. And we used to actually predict what would happen in a given year based on the historic record. And in some cases, we have the, the record going back 100 to 150 years. But these conditions we're experiencing are unprecedented. And so we're seeing actually conditions that we've never experienced before. So if we base our predictions on the playbook from 100 years ago, they won't be accurate. We have to expect the unexpected given this changing climate. Let's just talk about uh, electric vehicles yeah. by 2035. At first, that seemed like a crazy notion. But now you see the automobile, automobile industry, where they're headed. Now it doesn't seem so crazy. Right. California has led the world on climate action for the last 20 years. We were one of the first states to put into state law reducing our carbon pollution uh, in a certain amount of time. And we achieved that target four years early. Governor Newsom stepped forward, boy, less than two years ago and said, we in 2035 in California will not sell uh, polluting vehicles, those with internal combustion engines. And you're right, that was a shock right. uh, across the world. But within months, uh, other countries had followed suit and adopted that target. And automakers said that voluntarily they would stop producing those internal combustion traditional vehicles because they know the future is clean transportation. So California's leadership works. Carbon neutrality, 2045, is it possible? It is possible, okay. but it's ambitious. Okay. I mean, no major industrial nation uh, or state or province in the world is anywhere close to carbon neutrality. So it's an unprecedented target, unprecedented goal, but this is an unprecedented time. And I think we all agree, we wanna leave the world to our kids, our grandkids, their kids, um, that, 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 that's a, a beautiful, you know, well-functioning world. And in order to do that, we have to make a trans transition and we have to do so quickly. So we think carbon neutrality is aggressive, but achievable. And that really leads to my last question to the future, to kids watching this, to the younger generations that are going to have to deal with this even more than us. What would your message be? Kids, young people are the leaders of tomorrow. And un unfortunately, they're inheriting this challenge. What's optimistic uh, in my mind is if you look at the public opinion uh, folks view it's young people that want us to take more and more uh, aggressive climate action and this is achievable this isn't about finding technologies that don't exist this isn't about taking actions that we can't conceive we know what we need to do now we need to do it uh, and that's what we're all about uh, in the state of california is leading the way and I have to say, you know, residents, our communities across the state are stepping up in their own ways and they're really inspiring us to do more on the state level. Coming up on California's climate crisis, cutting down the threat before it even starts, how forest thinning is making our wildfires less severe, and could a mega flood be in our future? Morning meteorologist Adam Epstein shows us why researchers are sounding the alarm. Welcome back to California Climate Crisis. I'm Fox 40's Chief Meteorologist, Christina Warner. Drought and dry conditions have made wildfire season year round here in California. In the last five years, we've had 10 of the most destructive fires ever in the state's history. So that means firefighters now have to work out of season to help thin out forests. Fox 40's Dennis Shanahan has a look at those projects. Fire is a natural part of the life cycle of a forest. But as more of us choose to make our homes in the woods, a lot of effort goes into preventing fires from starting. As a result, forests grow very dense, thick with trees, brush, and bramble. Add years of drought to the mix, when these forests do catch fire, the fierce flames can be very difficult to stop. So our crews can't plug in right next to 40-foot flames. It's just not safe. 
Morgan Moore is a forestry assistant with CAL FIRE. Fox 40 News recently met up with him at a site north of Nevada City where crews are thinning out part of a heavily wooded forest. The main reason we're doing this is we're just trying to reduce fuel loading, especially near access roads for local residents because we don't want fire to start in one area and continue through to another area. So this is a part of a shaded fuel break. In a project like this, some trees are removed entirely. The ones that remain are stripped of their lower branches, the so-called ladder fuels, which fire can easily climb. Forest thinning aims to make fire slow down and stay close to the ground. Firefighters and crews and dozers can get at it more accessibly and can actually uh, stop it. When a forest is thinned out, what's removed is put in piles. At this site, nearby residents can take what they want for firewood. The rest will be burned by Cal Fire when conditions are right. Dennis Shanahan, Fox 40 News. Thanks so much, Dennis. A recent study found that California is at risk of a mega flood. That hasn't happened in over 150 years, and you can imagine when it did, the population was much less. Fox 40's morning meteorologist Adam Epstein has a look at an event that could be catastrophic. Researchers embedded a high resolution weather model within a climate model to produce detailed synthetic forecasts of two scenarios, arc history and arc future. Arc history uses data from our historical climate while arc future considers climate change. Both scenarios are devastating, but arc future ended up much worse, producing 45% more rain. The storm projected is actually a series of atmospheric rivers over the course of a month that produced 15 to 35 inches of rain in the valley and 25 to 35 feet of snow in the Sierra. This amount would cause flash floods, debris flows, rock slides, water contamination, food shortages, and more problems. A warmer climate will lead to higher snow levels. That means less snow, more rain, more runoff, and more flooding. The big question is, when will this happen? In the simulations, all eight of the largest megastorm events occurred in El Nino conditions. Meteorologists can predict ENSO conditions two to six months out, while atmospheric rivers can be forecasted five to seven days out. Climate change has more than tripled the risk of an extreme event like 1862 relative to 100 years ago. Our odds of this occurring have increased to one in 50 years, but if the temperatures keep rising, so do our odds. We have signs to look for, but the bottom line is that it's impossible to predict exactly when this is going to happen. One of the authors of this study says it's like a pendulum. Right now, it's swinging towards drought, but eventually and inevitably, it will swing towards flood. This leaves California in a precarious position where we must prepare for both extreme droughts and floods at the same time. This project is not over. The second phase of this study will focus on who would get flooded, how deeply, and for how long. The third phase will focus on policy, emergency response, and preparations. As far as what you and I can do, we can fight for policies to stop our climate from warming even further. And most importantly, stay informed, like you're doing right now. Thank you for tuning in. Christina, back to you. Up next on California's climate crisis, the future of farming. We're able to grow a full head of lettuce using approximately two or three gallons of water. How scientists are adapting to the ongoing drought and finding new ways to save water and crops. Welcome back to California's climate crisis. In time of severe drought, Californians must find ways to adapt, ways to conserve water. Imagine growing healthy crops using less water. It's possible. Fox 40's Dennis Shanahan has a look at what could be the future of farming. Tens of thousands of cars drive past it every day. You can't miss it along Interstate 80 in Davis. A massive greenhouse made of glass and steel with a prominent sign reading Gotham Greens. Fox 40 reached out to the company looking to learn more about what's going on inside. Well, it's great to have you here today. 
Viraj Puri is the co-founder and CEO of Gotham Greens. His roots are in New York. That's where the company's first greenhouse was built about 10 years ago to bring fresh greens to the Big Apple. And we actually operate a whole network of these facilities across the U.S. The Davis Greenhouse, constructed last year, is the company's first on the West Coast and one of its largest, covering three acres. Yet we're producing the crop yields of over 100 acres. Instead of soil, the roots of each plant are anchored in a small pot of peat moss, and they are planted in trays of nutrient-rich water. The technical term for this kind of farming is hydroponics. Compared to conventional outdoor lettuce growing, Puri says this method uses 95% less water. We capture all the irrigation water for reuse, so we're able to grow a full head of lettuce using approximately two or three gallons of water, while it can take up to 40 gallons of water to grow that same head of lettuce out in the field. We've got sensors that help um, track all the conditions, the light, the humidity, the CO2, the oxygen, all these different variables that a plant needs to grow. And then our computer control systems will help turn equipment on and off to achieve those conditions. There are no changing seasons in a Gotham Greens facility. It's always growing season. So we utilize natural sunlight to provide the photosynthesis that the crops need to grow. But we've got air conditioning systems, we've got heating systems. The greens are thriving and showing up on local grocery store shelves. They're not having to deal with uh, the hot weather, the cold weather, unseasonable rain or hail or wind. So they're very coddled plants, as we like to say, and uh, a happy plant makes for a healthy plant. The greenhouse is just a couple of miles away from the UC Davis campus and through a partnership with the university, it serves as a kind of three acre classroom for students studying the future of farming. We're training, if you like, the next generation of farmers who will be going to companies like Gotham Greens. Dr. Gail Taylor is a distinguished professor and chair of the Plant Sciences Department at UC Davis. Taylor says don't expect greenhouses to ever entirely replace outdoor farming. After all, the average person in America eats about 12 pounds of lettuce a year. So we really rely on sustainable production systems outdoors too. But these indoor farms can be game changers. Think of those food miles, trucking and flying food, around the country, around the world, that's not great for the environment. So suddenly with these indoor systems, we can place them where people need food. So we also cut down on food miles, which has a greenhouse gas cost. So it's another way we can improve the environment. And lettuce is just the tip of the iceberg. So I think it's really incumbent on us, farmers, entrepreneurs, technologists, uh, policy makers and academics, to really innovate and come up with new forms of farming that use less water. Farms of the future taking root today. In Davis, Dennis Shanahan, Fox 40 News. Thank you so much, Dennis. There's no doubt we're going to be challenged by climate change in the upcoming years, but there's one thing you can count on. The Fox 40 weather team is going to be here to help you get through it. We'll be on air and online. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Fox 40 News. Have a good night.